Well, Al, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And also, uh, welcome to Revolution Arrow. Very exciting. Uh, it's, it's great that you and your team could bring all of us together about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart, technology and the future of aviation. And in my particular case, a subject that I've been studying for the last year or so, which is the electrification of aviation. So, uh, as Al mentioned, over the course of my career, kind of starting as a physicist and aerospace engineer, I've had the opportunity to work on some really exciting projects. Uh, right out of school, I actually spent quite a bit of time working on the MX missile system, uh, and then had an opportunity to work on the space station for a young engineer. These were incredibly exciting projects. Also had the opportunity to both found and be a part of uh, three companies spanning technology and transportation systems. Ariba uh, in the late 1990s was a BDD e-commerce company, tech company, one of the first unicorns in Silicon Valley. Some of you may know Exojet was recently sold to Vistajet, very excited about that, building a very big company. And then more recently, Stellar Labs, which is a technology platform to optimize business aviation. So, uh, <clears throat> and it has occurred to me that we are at kind of a turning point, uh, the dawn of a new revolution in aviation, and that is the dawn of electric propulsion. But before I get into that subject, let me take you way back in time, about 100 years, to the first dawn in aviation, which was at the turn of the century, the 19th century. There were many, many attempts to fail, right around 1900, 1901, 1902. This was a red-hot space. There were dozens and dozens of projects including Langley trying to uh, get man to pursue powered flight. But all of those attempts fail. In fact, public sentiment got so bad on this subject that you'll be surprised to hear that the New York Times penned an op-ed on December 8th, 1903, that said man won't fly for a million years. To build a flying machine would require the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanics for one million years the New York Times proclaimed. Now, ironically, just nine days later, man flies. <laughs> December 17th, obviously we're all familiar with that famous date uh, in history. And over the next 100 years, we would essentially perfect the original Wright Brothers concepts. From 1903 to 1947 supersonic flight, transcontinental flight in 1957, supersonic commercial flight in 1976, and of course, the world's largest flying aircraft, 800 passengers that can go 8,000 nautical miles around the world. But all of these principles are essentially based on the original Wright Brothers principles. They involve mechanical fuel power plants, mechanical flight control systems, and of course, physical runways to take off and land. Today, we are at a turning point, a very, very interesting turning point. And being in the computer industry here in Silicon Valley, I kind of liken it to the turning point in computing at the dawn of what you would call electric solid state with the invention of the integrated circuit. Electric solid state was a breakthrough for the computer industry. It was simpler, more powerful, less expensive, more scalable, and obviously a lot more reliable. And today, this flying machine is electric solid state. It has a solid state flight control system. It has a solid state power system. It's 100% electric and only has four moving parts. And you think of the comparison to the computing and to, to flight, that's pretty profound. There are over 100 electric propulsion projects underway now. So I'm not the first person to notice this. Obviously, the whole industry has taken note. And if you look at the acceleration in projects in 2017, 2018, with over $2 billion invested, I would expect that the investment into this space is, is going to quadruple over the next decade. This not only involves startups that are going after the two- and four-seat market, but it also involves large companies like Boeing, Airbus, Google, and Uber. Now, Let's explore how electric propulsion might change aviation as we know it. Let's first take a look at commercial aviation today, which has one major deficiency. It doesn't work for short-range transport modes. 
commercial aviation as a mass transit system works great for 300 nautical miles to 8,000 nautical miles. But in the zero to 300 nautical mile segment, it's mostly dominated by ground-based transportation modes. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, including the high cost of mechanical flight systems, aircraft, the cost to maintain them, airports, and so forth. Obviously, there's sort of a trading point between routes thick enough to be able to handle them, long enough to be able to support those costs, and obviously the economies of scale of aircraft size. And you hit a sort of a break point in commercial aviation that starts at about 150 passengers with a trip that is at least 300 nautical miles, and this tends to be the point at where commercial aviation starts. It uh, accommodates an aircraft about the size of a 737 or A320, and then of course aircraft get bigger from there. There are other reasons. Airplanes require airports, and airports are extremely large, particularly in terms of real estate. Uh, here is Denver International Airport. It sits on 33,000 acres. That's about 50 square miles. Now, compare that to terminals that don't require runways. You've got Denver Airport, serves about 58 million passengers a year, on sitting on 33,000 acres. And to the right, we've got New York Grand Central Station. It serves 273 million passengers, nearly five times as many passengers, and it sits on just 44 acres. The difference, obviously, is that trains don't require runways. They only require bays. Now, but other than that, commercial aviation works great. It's just beyond 300 nautical miles. The real crisis we face today is in short-range transportation, as I think all of us know who live in densely populated metropolitan areas. Short-range transport is dominated by ground-based modes. Trains, planes, buses, excuse me, not planes. Trains, buses, ferries, and automobiles. And ground-based modes have many glaring deficiencies. One, they are increasingly landlocked. There is just not enough room to build more freeways, more train systems, more light rail systems, and the cost of doing so is skyrocketing. Ground infrastructure also costs billions to build and maintain. Once you build uh, train, uh, uh, train tracks as well as highways, you still have to maintain them at an extremely high cost. And it's only getting slower. And that problem is only getting worse. This is an amazing picture of, of a highway in China. New ground-based transport infrastructure is also silly expensive to build, particularly in metropolitan areas. Here in California, we have a high-speed uh, rail project. It is essentially a short-range transportation mode of travel. It's projected to cost about 80 billion. More likely, it's gonna cost 100 billion. It's gonna serve 24 cities with 24 stations. For those of you from Seattle, uh, Seattle has proposed a 62-mile light rail project, which will connect Tacoma, SeaTech, and Seattle. That will be $54 billion, probably will grow as well. Uh, and uh, it's projected to take about 25 years to build. And here in San Francisco, the Bay Area, we have something called the Caltrain Extension, and it's projected to cost $3 billion per mile. This is just for an extension of the train into San Francisco. So these systems are very, very expensive to expand upon, but aviation, by aviation standards, electric propulsion is revolutionary. So I just want to talk you through some of the reasons why. If you look at a fossil fuel turbine or motor, most of the energy in the jet A and the gasoline that goes into that is wasted as heat. Actually, about three quarters of it is spit out in heat and friction, and only about a quarter of the energy is converted to kinetic energy or forward motion. Electric motors, by comparison, are 94% efficient. So the electric energy that is 94% in converting to kinetic energy and forward motion. Only about 6% of the energy is lost in friction and flux losses. Electric motors are also lighter, substantially lighter. Here we have a Lycoming engine, weighs 400, over 400 pounds, produces about 300 horsepower. And to the right, we have an equivalent electric motor, weighs 70 pounds, and actually produces more horsepower at 350 horsepower. And electric motors are nearly maintenance free. A lot of people here in aviation are very familiar with the high cost of maintaining turbines. When you include that in helicopters, you also have collectives, 
transmissions, all sorts of complex moving parts. Sometimes the cost of maintaining an aircraft is larger than the fuel cost itself. But electric motors are nearly maintenance free. There's only one moving part, there's no heat, there's no combustion trying to blow the thing apart, and so they're almost near maintenance free. So electric motors are better, cheaper, more efficient, no oil systems, no fuel systems, no cooling systems. You can distribute them across the aircraft where you need power because they are lighter and they're also quieter, again, because there's no combustion involved. All of these things are critical in aviation. And obviously, they're zero emissions, which is fantastic. Electric motors have no waste product, no CO2, straight out of the box. And finally, electric is faster and surprisingly efficient. There have been a lot of studies that have been done on the energy consumption per passenger of an EVTOL aircraft. So I'm going to compare that to a train and a car and a bus for a 50-mile trip. And per passenger, given all the load factors and things of, of trains and buses, they're all within about 3 to $4 in energy cost for about a 50-mile trip. But an EVTOL obviously can fly fast at 150 miles an hour. So on a 50-mile trip, can get there in about 18 minutes, where it's on a good day, a train, car, and a bus might take 43 minutes up to an hour. Now that's without traffic. Add traffic, you can double those numbers to up to two hours. I actually travel from Napa down here. Often takes me two hours. It's 44 miles. Electric propulsion also solves another big problem, a phenomenal problem, actually, vertical takeoff and landing, or as we were all talking about this conference, VTOL. EVTOL requires vastly less infrastructure than cars, automobiles, and trains, or commercial air, which is served by runways. Obviously, you can take off on something the size of a helicopter pad. And it enables flight over densely populated metropolitan areas. Kind of a nice benefit. And from spaces that are a fraction of the size and cost of modern day airports. So, over the coming decade or two, let's explore where this might go. There are a lot of visions for where this might go, and I'm going to kind of present one to you here. So, first, let's look at EVTOL vehicle evolution. We're all familiar with drones today, which can carry a payload of approximately a pound speeds of up to 50 miles an hour for possibly 30 to about 40 miles. Over the next three to five years, there are numerous projects in the eVTOL space that will carry passengers, approximately 600 pounds, uh, two to four passengers, um, uh, faster distances, longer range. And it's not unreasonable to assume that over the next 10 to 15 years, we scale that up again to something the size that can carry 6,000 pounds of payload for up to 20 to 40 passengers. So let's explore for a second a 20 to 40 passenger eVTOL and what that can do for short range transportation. First of all, in aviation, economies of scale matter. They actually matter a lot. Um, first of all, if you have a 20 to 40 passenger eVTOL versus a two to four passenger, you can carry an order of magnitude more passenger throughput on that single aircraft. You have the opportunity to optimize aerodynamics and structures further, and we've seen that in almost every aviation project um, over, over the last few decades. You have the ability to use quieter and possibly more efficient ducted fans. They're up to 25% uh, more efficient. You also have the size and scale to include a hybrid Jet A APU backup, so you can put a little bit of fuel on board just in case you need it so that you can meet FAA Part 121 and 135 rules. You have the opportunity to put in scheduled routes, which are pre-approved by the FAA, so that you can actually put these things in mass quantity and the FAA ATC system can handle them. And obviously with scale, the economies of scale and the cost per passenger plummet. Now, let's also take a look at battery technology in the forecast. Today, eVTOL projects are flying somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 to 6. 60 to 100 uh, nautical miles. But with improvements in battery technology and near-term improvements with known aerodynamic scale, we can probably get up to an all-electric flight of about 300 nautical miles. So how big is the zero to 300 nautical mile transport market? Well, <clears throat> as measured by the Federal Highway Administration, short-range transportation is already four times larger 
than all the passenger miles flown on commercial airlines. So those people traveling one, two, three hours, up to 300 nautical miles by car on federal highways is already a substantially larger number than those who travel on commercial airways. And another example, a little bit near and dear to my heart because I do live in Napa, is let's say you work in downtown San Francisco. Now, for all of those who are not from San Francisco, it is a cool 56 degrees all summer long and pretty foggy. But, and also the real estate here is extraordinarily expensive, very expensive to live in San Francisco. But let's say that 44 miles away as the crow flies, you could travel in 18 minutes for about 15 bucks and live in sunny Napa, where it is 80 degrees all summer, at where the real estate cost is about one quarter to one third the cost of living in San Francisco. Well, where would you choose to live? You certainly might consider living in Napa if that transportation system existed. That means, if we could put that in place, you have an opportunity to dramatically relieve urban congestion. You can actually base eVTOL, or Vertiports, uh, in cities surrounding the Bay Area, expanding the envelope for where people can reasonably live and work in San Francisco from about 10 to 20 miles to as much as 50 to 100 miles. That has the opportunity to open up real estate, open up uh, abilities for people to, to live on the coast or live in the Indian territories of California. Dramatically change, in fact, where we work and where we live. Ironically, it also has the opportunity to improve long-range transportation. In the United States, of the 19,000 cities that exist in this country, only about 2.5% of them are served by commercial air service. Uh, that's about 500 airports. But if we can actually put vertiports that would take you directly into SFO, right to the tarmac or right to the gates, from surrounding cities, San Jose, Merced, uh, Stockton, Elk Grove, Napa, you would be able to actually board through TSA at a vertiport in surrounding cities, fly within about 10 to 15 to 20 minutes directly to SFO, no parking, go straight on board. In fact, if you could have TSA at that location, you could unload uh, the, the TSA problems at existing airports. So again, a revolutionary opportunity to almost increase by an order of magnitude the number of cities in the United States served from about 2.5% by air travel to over 25%. Now, let's also talk about probably a very interesting project, very exciting project here in California. It's California's bullet train or high-speed rail. <clears throat> Again, this is essentially a short-range transportation system connecting cities between 50 and 100 nautical miles, up to 300 nautical miles in length, it is projected to cost 80 to $100 billion. It will carry about 200,000 passengers per day. Uh, it's going to serve, it will have 24 stations serving essentially 24 cities. Believe it or not, it's pretty noisy for all those who are concerned about noise in aviation. This train actually produces about 100 dB as it whizzes by at 200 nautical miles an hour. And it's uh, due to be finished uh, by 2030. Now, what I've done, um, is penciled out an equivalent eVTOL system. And I put some incredibly conservative assumptions in this eVTOL system. So first of all, I assume 2,000, 200,000 riders per day at a 75% load factor flying about the equivalent number of hours that commercial airlines fly their, their equipment. And I put together a budget to develop this aircraft. The budget is extremely conservative. I used as a benchmark the largest airplane budget ever built, the ABUS Air 380. That was a budget of about $15 billion. So we're talking about developing a very small eVTOL aircraft. I'm going to use the budget of a 1.2 million pound A380, which was about $15 billion. Then we're going to buy enough eVTOL aircraft uh, at 40 passengers, equal to the cost of a regional jet, for about $25 million apiece. That's enough aircraft to actually carry through the throughput of the existing bullet train, about 10 billion. And now we're gonna build 50 vertiports, not just 25 that the 24 that the bullet train is handling, at a cost of about $75 million each. Now, keep in mind these vertiports are basically glorified large parking lots with a terminal and a fence around them, but I budgeted about 75 million a piece. Your total budget for that project would be about $28.7 billion. Now, 
compared to the uh, California bullet train, that means we can serve twice the number of cities at approximately one third the cost. And that's using these ridiculously conservative estimates for budget on the program. Furthermore, <clears throat> obviously a train is limited by the cities you can serve along a straight line. eVTOL doesn't require that. We can actually serve or create a mesh network of cities anywhere across California. The bullet train does not go to Northern California, but we could easily go to Northern California. And you can obviously grow the routes depending upon passenger load. They can be literally anywhere. You can go to Yosemite, you can go to all sorts of places. So now I don't want to poo-poo the California bullet train because I think it's a pretty exciting project, but that's a project that's based on existing technology. This is something that is based on potentially disruptive technology. So I think we're at a very, very interesting point in time, sort of an intersection in time. We've got this near crisis emerging in mass urban congestion and this huge problem in short range transportation. And at the same time, we have the emergence of a disruptive technology that can potentially solve it. And that's pretty exciting when those two things marry up. So I'm pretty excited. I think that's maybe a revolution. I'm very much looking forward to meeting the people in this audience and talking about this and other subjects in EVITAL. And hopefully we can get to work and make something happen and something will spawn out of this conference. So thank you very much. OK, we've got hundreds of questions on Slido, Paul, so grab a seat. <laughs> if you. Um, we'll go through these quickly. Um, does anyone in the room want to ask a traditional question? Because that trumps uh, Slido. Um, OK, we get our first comment involving the, the Jetsons, which is good. Yep. Uh, do you, this is from Jim Beckstein at Dasso. Do you envisage the eVTOL solutions to be only operated commercially, or do you see individual ownership like a car? That's a good question. I do think there will be a market for personal travel, people that are you know, very interested in this, people that own you know, small piston aircraft today, and they also own small light jets. So I, I do think that will happen. But I think the real impact of eVTOL will be in the commercial market, you know, turning this into something that's a mass transit system that has a greater public good. Uh, politically, that's much more feasible, where we can put in the infrastructure and the routes and work with air traffic control to really move a large volume of people and solve the urban congestion problem. OK, we've got, uh, the great thing is, I think a lot of these points are going to be covered as we go through the day. But the big question we're seeing at the moment is air traffic mm -hmm. management. And I would, you know, I would argue that air traffic management projects tend to be as delayed as long as rail projects. <laughs> I would agree. That's one of the benefits I see in a, in a 20 to 40 passenger eVTOL system is, is you know, there, there are concepts of flying thousands, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of, you know, two and four passenger personal air travel on demand going all over a city. I just don't see air traffic control handling that in the next decade or two. But if you can put in scheduled service along predetermined routes um, that are approved by the FAA with their own flight pass, that is much more manageable by air traffic control. So you can have public partnerships with with air traffic control to put these slim routes. And they, and they may be only 10 or 20 routes in the Bay Area to start with, but you can handle an enormous volume of passengers. As I talked about in uh, the California bullet train, we're not talking about a lot of routes, maybe 50 routes uh, in total. But if they're scheduled and predetermined, uh, air traffic control has a vastly better capability of handling that and a lot of throughput than just you know straight on demand, you know little planes, you know, Hit your button, get on board, file a flight plan. That, that's 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 less likely to happen, in my opinion. Any more questions from the room? And I guess the final question, um, which I think just deserves credit, um, what happens? Your idea about flying to Hub Airport. The the question for the audience is actually what happens to the savings when you factor in TSA times anyway. That's a really good question. So a lot of you may not know that the Bay Area actually had such a system in the 1970s. They flew Sikorsky uh, uh, S91s. They carried about 19 passengers from surrounding cities 
in the Bay Area. You could, you could take off from, from Marin in Sausalito, and in eight minutes, a helicopter will carry you straight to the tarmac uh, in SFO. My, when I grew up, my father never drove to SFO. He actually went to Sausalito and took a helicopter for something like 50 bucks. Uh, and that, that combination of helicopters carried about 270,000 passengers from surrounding areas in the Bay Area directly to SFO. Obviously, the service went bankrupt as the cost of fuel and serving these helicopters went out. But with eVTOL, there's an opportunity to bring that back. So in New York City, for example, we all are familiar with the, the terrible problem of trying to get from New York City to the surrounding airports can take an hour, an hour and a half. By helicopter or by eVTOL, that might be six to eight minutes. And what a dream that would be, particularly if it was inexpensive and in a mass transit format. Okay, we've got a question from the, the microphone's on its way to you. Just wait. Thanks. Um, Henry Hardevelt from Atmosphere Research writing for Airways Magazine. Do you envision these aircraft as uh, uh, pilotless, autonomous vehicles? No. Or do you I, I, I just don't think you're going to get away with that in, in the near future. Um, if you have 20 to 40 passengers, you need personnel on board, safety people and, you know, people on board and, and just in case things happen. So I would imagine they would have actually two pilots on board. Um, and if you're spreading that cost over 40 passengers, that's a, a very, very small cost. Uh, but I think you do want passengers, uh, you do want pilots on board. Although they may be almost automatic in flight, but they're just managing the systems. But I think it's going to be a long time before we get to pilotless. And particularly to get through the FAA to approve pilotless. Okay, final question. Um, a nice easy one. <laughs> since you've, how much would a one way, oh, we've got a question at the front from us. Sorry, the microphone's just coming. Good morning, Renetta Johnson from Intradiable. Thank you very much. Um, I was really curious about the challenges that you see coming from the public. I think this is something that has proven that it's been a major barrier for implementing revolutionary projects. So what are your thoughts about what are the potential coming objections that you should account or already maybe have experienced? I, th I think the big challenge uh, for all transportation projects has been noise, right? So uh, even the California bullet train is noisy. Uh, on, the, on the ground, it's producing about 100 dB. That's about equivalent to a helicopter taking off. Uh, airports and, and uh, aviation has, you know, uh, always been in, in concerned about noise. Electric is quieter, and if you use ducted fans and other technologies, uh, they're quieter than helicopters, potentially. So, uh, but you know, there's with everything, there's always a trade off and there's always a battle. But uh, I think the primary challenge uh, is making it as quiet as possible. Other than that, um, you know, it's just, it's just the evolution of technology. Okay, final question How much would a one way eVTOL e ticket so, cost? So, um, I showed some examples about the energy cost, which was about $4 for a 50 mile trip. That'll actually go down with a larger eVTOL uh, aircraft. Th those projections were based on two to four passenger aircraft. And in commercial aviation, fuel is about one third the cost. Uh, so if you scale that up, you're looking at potentially $15, maybe $20 to make it economical between, say, um, St. Helena, which is about 50 miles north of here in the heart of Napa Valley, and San Francisco. It might rise to maybe $30 for a 100 mile trip. So surprisingly economical. And of course, if you can live in these surrounding cities at you know, one third or one quarter the cost of living in San Francisco from a real estate perspective, that, that absolutely justifies itself. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. <laughs>